actually verses, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And Brother Mark has put them up for us, if you can read that, I can read that. I'd love for you to join in with me, please. 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And while you're turning there, if you don't mind, go back to Ezekiel 37, where we were last week, so we can finish that one up. Uh, the Holy Spirit just seemed to in invade our, our time together last week. Do you remember that? Yes. What a beautiful session that was. Do you, do you think you were in church last week? Amen. I did. I did. My goodness, God is good, and He was good last Sunday. I want to pick up where we left off there and get into our message for today. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. This know also that in the last days... Perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Remember that one. Despisers of those that are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Heavenly Father, your word is true. Your word is right. It's powerful. It's never going to change. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. What you meant 500 years ago, you mean today. You don't change. You are immutable. You are infallible. And we trust in you. Lord, I pray for the church of the living God today all around America. The church is in trouble, Lord Jesus. And mainly because of our own doing, because of our own laziness, because of our own sins. And Lord, this is a message that I'm excited to preach I believe you birthed this message in me many, many months ago, and I'm so excited to share it with my brothers and sisters in this room. Be glorified as we lift up the King of kings and Lord of lords. In your name we pray. All God's people said. Amen. The passenger of a taxi cab tapped the driver and was going to give him some directions to where he wanted to leave off or get off the cab, get out of the cab, and the cabbie went nuts. He jumped, he screamed, he turned the wheels, almost ran into a truck, ran up on the sidewalk, and almost went through a, a storefront window. And the cabbie looked back, shaking. He said, please don't ever do that again. You scared the life out of me. And the passenger said, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't mean to. I just wanted to let you know my stop's coming up. And the cabbie said, oh, it's not, it's not your fault. It's my fault. I'm so sorry. This is my first day driving a cab. No. <laughs> I've been driving a hearse for 25 years. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like God's been driving a hearse for 25 years. It's really true. In Revelation, we read of a church called Sardis, and they lived the name that they thought they were living, and yet, and yet John said, you're dead. You're a dead church. Everything you do is rotten. It's, you're just dead. And I wanted to bring this word to the church of Jesus Christ this morning. Everything in this world is so good. It looks so good because things are looking so bad. <laughs> Everything looks good because things are looking so bad. We're going to get back to 2 Timothy in just a minute. But I'd like to pick up a little bit where we left off here with um, the dead bones, the valley of dry bones. I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back for a powerful church. Amen. I really do. Yes, there will be a falling away. There will be an apostasy. There, there is today. And I know you may not agree with me with this, but you have your right to be wrong. But I believe that COVID-19 was more than just a plan, I mean, pandemic. I believe there's a purpose for it. Do you know that over 
2,700 churches shut their doors in one year. Is that a bad thing? Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe, as Peter tells us, judgment has begun in the house of the Lord. Because that which was made straight by the Lord Jesus has been made crooked by crooked preachers that are not preaching the word. They're watering everything down because they want to build bigger barns. And you know something? They're, enjoy these days, family, because there's going to come a time when all these chairs are going to be built. I believe that. I believe there's going to come a time when we may have to buy new ones or more of them. I believe that we serve a great God. Amen. And I believe He's coming back for a magnificent church, a glorious church, a militant church. Oh my goodness. When was the last time you sang Onward Christian Soldiers? <laughs> when was the last time you heard a message about the blood? When was the last time you heard it? Now I'm preaching to the choir here. You probably heard it last week. But most churches don't hear it. They don't hear about the blood. They don't, it's too gory. It's, it, it, it invades their comfort zone. And they don't even hear about that. Because they only want to hear what you want to hear. Oh my goodness, David, you read my notes. They only hear what they want to hear. What their itching ears are begging me. Tell me how good I am. Tell me how I don't need God because I am one. Tell me how I don't have to obey this book. It's a bunch of fables and prose and poetry. It was great in its time, but even the newest versions are not acceptable anymore. But there is a church. There is a remnant. There is a third day generation of people that are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Did you, they, took a, they took a poll. I love polls. They took this one poll. The average Christian, are you ready for this? Here's over 4,000 sermons in their lifetime. They spend approximately eight years of their life in church. They sing thousands of songs, hymns, choruses. They are inundated with the word. The average Christian, in spite of all those beautiful numbers, has never led one person to the Lord Jesus Christ. The average Christian. That convicted me. Because it's one thing to, oh, I could say, Brother Bob, you preached at a youth rally and 212 kids got saved. And I can really take credit for that. The problem is that's all the Holy Spirit's work. Amen. I didn't kneel down and pray with one of those young people. All the youth workers did. I didn't lead any of them. And as I read those statistics about my life, am I the average Christian? Are you the average Christian? Or are you above average, Diane? I think you're above average. <laughs> I, I, I believe this church is above average. Amen. I'm begging the Lord Jesus Christ to do it in this church what he did in Ezekiel. In spite of the day we're living in. I started off negative, it's going to get even worse. Ezekiel 37. Let's turn to verse 7. So I prophesied and I was as I was commanded. I prophesied. And there was a noise. Remember we talked about the noise. And there was a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to bone. Can you imagine being in that valley? And seeing nothing but stench and rottenness and dust and decay begin to come together. What if the church of the living God began to come together? What if we began to put to put bitterness aside? And I don't. I don't. Do you see what she's trying to do? I can't believe that pastor wears a suit. I can't believe it. Didn't, didn't he know these are modern times? I love wearing a suit. I feel comfortable preaching from a suit. If I didn't wear a suit, I would feel unprepared. <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> That's just me, though. That's just me. But I'm saying, what if the church came together? What if the bone to bone and joint to joint? And more than that, let's read what happens next. There was a problem. Ezekiel said, and when I looked, 
the sinews and the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. There was no spirit. There was no life. They were zombies. Now, I'm praying there is not one person in this room that's hooked on the walking dead. But Ezekiel was a living eyewitness to the zombies. They were standing. They had flesh. They had faces now. They had cartilage and ligaments. They were connected bone to bone, arm to shoulder. They were, they were right, but there was no life in them. Churches come together and the program is perfect. The music is just outstanding. But there's no life in it. You come in empty and you're entertained for 35 minutes, maybe an hour if there are a lot of announcements, and you walk out empty. They're doing all the things. They have more programs than ABC has. But they're empty. They're dying. They're dead. There's no, there's, they, they have a form of godliness. But there's no power. Oh, to hear a preacher with power. They're rare today. I'm not one of them yet. But I pray with all my heart through brokenness and fasting that God would break me from who I am. And anoint me with his spirit to become the man of God I've always prayed to become. Please pray with me on that. I'm not what I want to be, but thank God I'm not who I used to be. Amen. I just need to throw this, this little commercial in here too. I love to hear you sing. I love to hear you praise. I was sitting in front of these two. I didn't even know John could sing. <laughs> but he did. And he does. Pauline. She was singing harmony. I haven't heard harmony in church in so long. She was singing beautiful harmony. Diana. I think the angels choir in heaven just kind of hushes. Ladies in this church can sing so beautifully. Now I know men can too. Brother Mark leading us in praise and worship. Do you know what I love about Brother Mark? He gets lost in the song. He just gets lost in the praise. Isn't that how it's supposed to be? Church, let's just set aside tradition just for a second. And, 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 and the way, aren't we supposed to be lost in Christ? Lost in His love. Not caring what other people think about us. What if I, you know, if I raised my hands and many of my Baptist church friends, they would escort me out. We don't do that here. That's charismatic. That's Pentecostal. No, it's not. We're commanding the word to raise, lift up holy hands. Why do we disobey that? Because of what? Because of what? We don't want to be like them. It's time for the breath of God to fill, to fill the church again. We fall to overflowing. Yes. I got to get on. I'm, uh, I'm trying. You're not allowed today, so this may be a three hour message. <laughs> they, then he said to me, Prophesy unto the wind, Ezekiel. Prophesy, son of man. Say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God. I love that command. Thus saith the Lord God. These are Ezekiel's words. Winds, you better obey because God says to. Right. Don't be so awesome. Come from the four winds. Come from the north. Come from the south. The east and the west, O oh breath. And breathe upon these slain that they may live. And verse number 10, follow. I prophesy as God commanded me. Isn't it time for preachers to preach what God commanded them? Not what people want to hear, but what God can. Hey, if I'm going to a bridge and I'm on a train and the, and the bridge is out and the bridge is broken, I don't want somebody to say, how nice is that train? Let's just let them go. I want someone to warn me. The bridge is out. Stop the train. Jump off. Whatever you got to do. You have no future if you stay on this train. Church, we have no future if we stay on the train when the bridge is out. 
It's time for preachers to obey God. They may lose members. They may even lose friends. They may even lose their wife. But it's time for men of God to be men of God. Ezekiel said, Winds, listen. It's not to me. It's not me. I'm just being the, the obedient messenger. Listen to the Lord God. Listen to Him. Listen to Him. I prophesied as He commanded me. And the breath, the breath, not a breath, not some breath, the breath came into them. And they lived and stood on their feet, an exceeding great army. It didn't say they were an exceeding great glee club. It didn't say they were an exceeding great youth group. They were an army. They were ready for war. That's what I'm trying to tell you. The, uh, I think it was Amos told us to prepare for war. It's coming. And by the way, it's here. If you haven't sensed spiritual warfare in your life yet, you're about ready to. It's, it's here. There is no place to hide anymore, church. You're either on board or you're not. And I'm warning you as, as one who loves you, there's going to come a time when the Christians are going to be incarcerated. Are you ready? Are you ready? I remember, I remember when I was a teenager at a big church, like we ran maybe a thousand, and I, I, you know, our youth group sat kind of in the middle. And one Sunday night, our pastor had this great idea about an end time skit. And about one third of the way through his message, men came breaking through the doors wearing all black and hoodies and guns, take guns. And they ran up and took the pastor hostage. And then they took his wife and they were holding her. And, and then they made all the deacons and the elders get off to the side in the choir loft. And they held them captive. And they began to say, deny Christ. This evening, right here, right now. Or we'll start killing every deacon, every deacon's wife, the pastor's wife. And then we'll, we'll save the pastor for last because we want him to watch all these others die. I was petrified. What would you do? I didn't know it was a skit. This is San Jose, California. Anything can happen in California. <laughs> and I began to literally tremble. Who's going to do it? Who's going to stand and deny Jesus Christ in front of the whole body of believers? I was shocked because, like popcorn, people started to pop up all over the building, and they walked forth. I'll deny, I'll deny, I'll deny, and I was in shock as a teenager. How could they do that? How could you deny the Savior who died for you? He died for the pastor. He died for his wife. You can't threaten us with heaven. As a teenager, why are you denying the king who saved you? They all lined up. There must have been, in that Sunday evening service, 50 to 75 people lined up along the altar, ready to deny Christ. One by one, the leader of the black group, the gunmen, took his hoodie off, his mask off. And he said, my name is so-and-so. I'm the youth pastor at a local church right down the street. All these people with me, and they all put their plastic guns down, their fake guns down, took off their... They were all members of the church. It was all a skit. And the pastor gave the young man a hug and said, thank you for proving my point. We're not ready. We're not ready. And as a young man, I have never forgotten that night. I was shocked. I was shocked at the people who walked forward to deny Jesus Christ in front of the pastor and his wife and the leadership of the church and in front of the teenagers who were looking to them for leadership and guidance and, 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 and strength and support. What if that happened in here? It's not going to, by the way. Yeah. I, I promise I wouldn't do that. There's too many of us with heart conditions. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't do that to you. 
But what a night that was. The army was changed a little bit that night in my office. What happened to the army? What happened to the soldiers who are not afraid to fight? Spiritually. There's three things about the church. Oh my goodness, I have so many notes here. I just, I just went crazy with this. I'm sorry. But I do want to say this. There's three phases about it. Three things about the church. First of all, the church is a militant church. It's militant in the area of spiritual warfare. We're not going to pick up guns and, 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 and AR-15s. We're not going to go walking down the street shooting people. But we are going to stand with the sword and with the word of God and the shield. And we're going to stand for our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Will you stand with me? Will you stand when your best friends refuse to stand? Will you stand as the body, as a soldier of Jesus Christ? Yes, the, the day is going to come. I know you will, Dave. I know you will. It's going to come. Young people, young guys, stay strong in Jesus. Stay strong in Him. Follow godly leadership in your family. It's also a penitent church. It's militant as we endure and, and battle spiritually <coughs> every day. It's also penitent. It's a broken church. Bro not, not in a broken sense that it's not fixable. It's, bro it's broken in spirit. The cry of the triumphant church is one of humility and saying, Lord Jesus, you do all the increasing We'll do the decreasing. Let us hide behind your cross so everybody can see you. You are worthy, Lord Jesus. You're the king. And we just want to sing to you. We want, we want to be penitent. I think that's why I like giving invitations sometimes. Not all the time. I love it when the Spirit leads for us to do that. Because there are moments, and usually I, you know, I, I let the Holy Spirit lead me as I look into your eyes and decide, maybe this is a good time for God's kids, or someone who doesn't know the Lord, to have that opportunity. We're a penitent church. Broken. Because actually, the Lord Jesus left, left it up to us to the Lord. Yes. We have a work to do, don't we? Do? It is militant. It is penitent. And finally... And the greatest of all, I couldn't wait to get to this part. It's triumphant. The church of Jesus Christ is not going to die. How do we know that? Someone tell me from Matthew 16. How do we know? Dean, you shared this with me as you walked out last week. The church of Jesus Christ is triumphant and glorious and powerful and going to live on and on and on. Why? Because thou art Peter. And upon this rock, this rock of revealed revelation to you, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed to you who I am. Only God told you that. Because of that revelation, because you know the King of kings and Lord of lords, the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, will never prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. I need to read you a song Bill Gaither wrote many, many years ago. Are you ready? Hang on, put your seatbelts on. God has always had a line. Many a foolish conqueror has made the mistake of thinking that because he had forced the church of Jesus Christ out of sight, he had stilled its voice and snuffed out its life. But God has always had a people. The powerful current of a rushing river is not diminished because it's forced to flow underground. Now we know the purest water is the stream that bursts crystal clear into the sunlight after it has been forced, it has forced its way through solid rock. There have always been charlatans who, like Simon the magician, sought to barter on the open market that power which cannot be bought or sold. But God has always had a baby. Men who could not be bought and women who were beyond purchase. God has always had a people. God has always had an army. There have been times of affluence and prosperity when the church's message has been nearly diluted into oblivion by those who sought to make it socially attractive, neatly organized, financially profitable. Oh, but God has always had a people. 
It's been gold-plated, dripped in, dripped in purple, and crusted with jewels. It has been misrepresented. The church has been ridiculed, lauded, and scorned. But God, our God, has always had a people. And these followers of Jesus Christ have been, according to the women of the times, elevated as sacred leaders and condemned as modern heretics. Yet through it all, there marches on that powerful army of the meek, God's chosen people who cannot be bought, broken, murdered, or still. On through the ages they march. The church, God's church triumph. God has a people right here in this building. Amen. God has a powerful people in here in this building. I watch Wednesday nights. We're moving chairs in for more people to join us in prayer. And to study the book of Acts together. How I love that. How I love hearing the pages of God's word turn. I love that. I do. I love the prayer requests. I love hearing God's people pray. This morning... Oh my goodness, we started in the prayer room. We ended up going upstairs. We outgrew the prayer room. <laughs> Thank God for George and Diana's family. Amen. Amen. God has always had a people. A people that have been surrendered. A people that are on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. An army, triumphant. We're going to win. We've already won. <laughs> 